Hello, I'm Hobby Jackal and this is Jackalcast. In this episode I will be chatting about the amazing Adepticon Warhammer reveals, pulling information from both the video interviews and the articles published on the day, and most importantly chatting about what we might be expecting next. Let's crack on! Right, so I thought the Warhammer reveals at Adepticon 2024 were absolutely amazing. And following positive feedback to my last Jackalcast episode, I'm going to carry on with that format which is fairly conversational and kind of suiting both podcast and video format. Now the only reason I got my last video out so quickly was that my seven week old was in hospital for five days, poorly with chest infection, although you know he's pretty stable once he's in, NHS absolutely amazing. And I was sat there with him, loads of wires and all sorts of things on my sort of rocking chair with a little mobile for editing. So this one probably won't be making it out super close to Adepticon because I've only got time when there's a baby or a toddler on me to do the editing. On that basis, I will be chatting about the reveals, which you all probably know about by now, so I won't spend too much time, and then I'll be chatting a bit more about what this potentially means, what it might mean for the future, with a big focus on AOS 4th Edition, because I'm quite excited about it. So I'm going to zip through these in the same order they appear on the Adepticon logo image, starting with Warhammer 40k. So we're presented with two Chaos Lords, each of these are coming first off in their own army boxes, themed around different things. Both of these were predicted already by Chapter Master Valrak, although there were some rumblings and rumours of one of them being in Terminator armour. Speaking of Valrak, I don't keep entirely up to date on the 40k rumours, and he might even appear in the comments telling me what I got wrong. Hi Valrak. Uh, but I believe next we've got things such as the Agents of the Imperium, Blood Angels some point later this year. There are some rumours out there that the Tau may be getting Vespids, I'm not sure if that's a Valrak thing or not, uh, and I don't know if that's just because people have looked at the Tau range and gone, they need an update. And there's also rumours that Commissar Yarrick, in spite of the time jump in 40k, is still rocking around and alive, so Yarrick is a Commissar, uh, he's got a big orc claw on his arm, he's a, the a nemesis of Gaskell Fracker, he's got a lot of names in the middle. Uh, this is my 40k knowledge <laughs> off the top of my head, so a bit ropey. Uh, that's really cool though, I'd like to see his model reimagined. And that's it for 40k, I'm going to move straight on to Age of Sigma because um, I'm psyched. Alright, let's touch on Dawnbringers first. So I'm pulling a bit from the interviews here as well, but basically Sigma uh, decided he needed to make a, a gesture to the realms or to the people, almost like a propaganda move, to be like, everything's okay. Let's send out some of the biggest Dawnbringer Crusades, it's going to go great, we're going to found two new cities. Uh, and we were told from the start, in true Warhammer style, that at least one of those was going to fail. I, I think I don't think they were allowing both of them to fail, but uh, I don't know, who knows. So anyway, one of these is an Akshi, um, built over a haunted place, they duffed up a load of Night Haunt, and that's called Embergard. And rumours from the stores running sort of campaigns and things that that's actually the city that appeared in that teaser trailer. So this one was founded by Zenestra, she's one of the various nutters in the city of Sigma, uh, and she represents the, the it is cult of the wheel from the cities of Sigma, and she has to be carried about because to roll her along on wheels uh, would be sacrilegious. Uh, it's, it's an interesting take. And then you have the second half of this crusade, which is called the Twin-Tailed Crusade, so there's two parts, uh, which is in Gyra, so the Realm of Life, and they've trapped, they've had a horrible time going through mangroves and facing disease and all sorts of things, uh, and they founded the city of Verdigree. Now, interestingly, we have a new antagonist popping up in the Sixth Dawnbringers book, Abraxia. Sorry about the light here as well, we're getting sunshine in the UK, which is really unusual. Not seen it for about six months. Abraxia is the right-hand woman of Archaon, uh, and is leading the Varangard, who are essentially all Chaos Lords each, so the fact that she's risen to the top from the pit fights to this position is quite amazing. Um, Archaon you know, this is great, I've got a really powerful person on my side, but it's sort of like, on my side, so he's slightly concerned. So he gives her this great weapon, this spear, which if it just nicks somebody it causes mutations and all sorts of horrible things to happen. Uh, but the catch is that if Abraxia loses concentration for a moment, it will do the same thing to her. And having lost concentration once before for a moment, uh, she grew these bloody great horns. So yeah, it's sort of a way of controlling her. I should imagine if she, you know, ponders trying to take out Archeon, she'll turn into a big blob. So anyway, um, Abraxia is rocking up to Verdigree, which doesn't spell well for them. We've been told one of them will fail though, and it sounds like bad things happening both sides, and we know that, uh, I'm going to be jumping to the trailer in a little bit, we know that in Akshi uh, there's a shed load of rats appearing, so I imagine they're going to face a little bit of that. So it's Warhammer though, this wasn't going to be good in any situation. So alongside the book, which features Abraxi, you're also getting the Nexus Chaotica, which is a power engine, a bit like the Nexus Siphon or the uh, Aqualift of the Cities of Sigmar. 
uh, and rather than sort of drawing energy or purifying things, it's, it's just, you know, they're, they're just messing things up with chaos, planting this in the ground and doing horrible things. And that's coming as a scenery piece. And interestingly, we're told this book will propel forward the Vandus Hammerhall and Korg's Cull story, which was introduced in the first edition around the Realmgate Wars. Uh, so Vandus was a Stormcast Eternal, and uh, Korg's Cull had killed all his family when he was alive. So, you know, instant reason for these two to uh, have a little bit of dislike there. We are told that Vandus is slowly losing his personality, he's solely focused on this vendetta. It sounds like we're told that one of those two is going to die, but it's not who you expect it is. Now, I don't know who I expect it is, so I don't know what that means. Uh, it sounds like Phil Kelly, who sort of leads the, the, the fluff side, the lore side of um, Age of Sigmar, is trying to surprise us. So, um, in my mind, it's not massively surprising if Vandus were to take out Hull. Although perhaps I'm more expecting Cole to take out Vandus and then ascend to demonhood because that was even touched upon by them and has been rumoured by everybody because that's sort of the way you go, that's what he's aspiring towards. And so perhaps one of the twists, and I did see somebody put this on a post and I was kind of leaning slightly that way, is could Vandus, by going fully into Vendetta mode as a Stormcast, could he potentially uh, get the favour of Korn? Because in Warhammer Fantasy Battles especially, that was kind of, if people became solely focused on uh, martial prowess or the hunt or something like that. This is how Korn kind of like sneaks in and I don't know if that's possible with Stormcast. We haven't really had a Chaos Stormcast and the closest we've had uh, is Eternus, uh, one of the Chaos characters who was sort of plucked from all the mess of um, or empowered by the Stormcast souls by Bellacor. So yes, very interested to see where that goes. So right, jumping to the trailer. So um, I was intending to sort of break this down frame by frame and that kind of thing, but as I said, I'm probably by the time I've edited this, coming to this quite late in the game, and I imagine 10 other people would have already done that, uh, and it might be a bit boring. I'll start by saying I think it's absolutely amazing. On the off chance you haven't seen it, I will include a link to that um, in the comments and the description. Uh, go and watch it, it's brilliant. Love it, love the quality. So it starts off with somebody who looks almost like a dark oaf, so somebody that's left out in the, in the realms, or uh, they die in combat are whipped away from Nagash in one of the coolest scenes in the whole video. It's a giant Nagash kind of like looming over them and forged into a storm Stormcast. Very quickly in the trailer they address what the lie was. So this was part of my previous video. We were umming and ahhing about what the lie would be and I suggested two things. One of them is that the Stormcast are, are okay, they are immortal, that kind of thing. And the other one was that uh, Azir is in fact unbreachable and is a safe haven. Um, that one may turn out to be not true, but it's actually the, the former of those two I've just discussed. So basically it's a Stormcast addressing the lie from Sigmar. Um, they're not super angry about it, but they're basically saying it was a lie that we're immortal. We are not immortal. Uh, or, you know, as an individual, they are definitely not immortal because every time they are reforged by Sigmar, they lose a little piece themselves. So they might be immortal in terms of their body uh, and even that, seems to be going in a potentially slightly ropey direction. Basically they're sort of, as time goes on, they're getting more and more martial prowess but losing more and more of themselves. We jump about a number of battles until we see them in new armour at the very end, um, which sort of actually is described by the people working behind it as this is the ruination chamber, this is something we've been chatting about uh, on forums and that kind of thing. There's two chambers left to be opened by Sigmar that we're aware of, uh, and the other one's like the Logister or something like that chapter, which sounds quite boring. It's kind of like the, I believe described as almost like the librarian type people, the ones that sort of, you know, do the Stormcast nerd work. Uh, whereas the Ruination was a curious one. And it turns out the Ruination are the Stormcast that are towards the end of their journey. They've been reforged a whole host of times. They're a little bit broken in spirit. Their personalities are completely worn away, but they are still good in a fight. However, presumably because Sigmar feels slightly bad about their personalities being grated away, uh, he pops them into monasteries and sacred places and that kind of thing just to sort of mess about with presumably pot plants and that kind of thing, or I guess they sort of work quite well as a, as a good guardian or deterrent from evil folk messing with those things. Uh, however, when shit goes down, which uh, is very much the case in this trailer, it does appear that he is willing to pop open the Ruination Chamber, or rather pluck them from their peaceful monasteries to, to do the dirty work and go where even a Stormcast would be hesitant to go, or a Stormcast they might not be hesitant to go, but they will almost certainly just cark it like that. 
So chatting Stormcast, we are seeing Thunderstrike armor appearing on the first edition Stormcast. So we can see Prosecutors there, the winged Stormcast, this time sporting uh, spears and shields rather than the hammers, which is probably much more effective when you're flapping about the place. And also Liberators who are sporting the new armor and interestingly we have already seen them in this new armor because they were not, not leaked but essentially presented to us in the Realms of Ruin game. Which does make me wonder if they're going to have a fifth faction. They currently have four faction, one from each of the um, Grand Alliances. And I wonder if they will introduce Skaven alongside the summer launch, you know, for a bit of publicity and get people into the game and that kind of thing, because they clearly knew about this armor revamp. So tying up the Stormcast side of this video, we've got um, a, a Ruination Chamber Lord on a griffin type creature. And again, we've got these kind of three uh, Ruination Stormcast who are wandering towards the Skaven explosion, which happens in this trailer. So onto the Skaven. Lots of rumors. There's also lots of leaks for Age of Sigma. So I'm going to cover those, but I'm going to cover them towards the end of this section. Just I know some people don't want these things to be spoiled. At the time of filming, there are eight blurry images that appear to be taken of these models. They are so blurry that they are like worse quality images than the sort of room engines and the hype building that Warhammer themselves do. So whilst this person's given us this stuff, they, they seem to almost be taking a kind of very Warhammer publicity team approach and you know just giving us little snippets which is which is quite good fun actually it's sometimes nicer than having like a clear picture of the entire box spoiled to you it's just little tidbits. So on the Skaven front uh, they suggested that we'd be getting new clan rats so there are clan rats all over the video if clan rats are featuring in this box in this new box they're almost really likely to be push fit and there are always brand new models in this set so something that becomes a reality even though the clan rats for the Skaven were one of the kits that I sort of thought actually probably could have lasted a bit longer. And I've still got the um, Island of Blood versions. We're then seeing this, uh, this amazing contraption, which they do refer to in the interview as the Rattling Gun. So Rattling Gun was previously one of the weapon teams, uh, and it was much smaller than this version, but this does seem to be a souped up version, and the interviewers are referring to it as that. But um, this is the sprue that we've seen leaked in its entirety already. We're also getting Rat Ogres. And we've got a Skaven Warlord riding a giant rat creature. It looks too small to be a brood horror, which was this horrifying uh, Forge World thing, which is also turned up in background books and all sorts of other things. Uh, and a bit too big to be a wolf rat. Although the same uh, rumor sharer does say that wolf rats are returning. Now, whether it's this creature, which is gonna be called a wolf rat or something entirely different, I don't know. A uh, brilliant part in the video as well, where that creature that is riding is killed and the warlord just runs off. So the other thing we're seeing in that video are the Dezales, so these are weapon teams um, and they're the guns that they hold with two of them over a shield, uh, which is really cool. It's going to be good to see that reimagined. The weapon teams have been rocking around for a good old time um, and we did get a new warp fire thrower in Island of Blood, that same kid I mentioned before with rad ogres. Prior to that they were just the metal ones and I think they're the ones that have been available for a long time. So it's confirmed this edition is arriving in summer 2024 and as we described in my previous video we, we knew this was coming, they go on a three year cycle. It's described as the Hour of Ruin, and the big explosion is called the Vermin Doom. An entire nation of Skaven, billions, are bursting forth into the Great Parch in Akshi, pulling a whole chunk of Blight City with them. Alongside this, they are opening up rents across all of the mortal realms, spilling forth Ratkin all over the place. So this is not just linked to the Realm of Fire, this is everywhere. This is the, the big ones in Akshi, though. So before I jump on to what I'm expecting to see next and the leaks that have already happened, I'm just going to chat about the extra information they gave us about this edition, about the rules and that kind of thing. So they said really clearly this is the biggest change since the first edition of Age of Sigma. They are nine years down, nearly a decade, they've got all the feedback, all the learning and they've decided it's time to rejig the whole thing. That does mean this is what we will refer to as an index edition. So every single army in the game is getting uh, a new PDF document to support them. Uh, these are called faction packs and they will be available at launch. And uh, the reason for this is just that there's so much change to the rules that those books are no longer compatible. The intention is to open this up to more players than ever before and make it as easy as possible to jump into the game without taking away the tactical depth. The intention is to build upon the interactivity, so there's, there's things for both players to do, so in the other player's turn there's plenty for you to do to mess with them. They're intending to give us nail-biting finishes, so it's unlikely you're going to be taking too much of a lead in the early rounds of the game, although, you know, it's still possible. And they gave some really clear answers to some of the changes, so range on melee weapons has gone completely. All melee combatants can now hit when they're within three inches. 
And when they're talking about accessibility of rules and making it easy for new players, they're actually saying that actually they're trying to keep things much more elegant, benefiting everybody and actually just avoiding big chunks of text. On this note, universal rules are returning to Warhammer Fantasy. So this is something that has existed before in previous games, I believe it exists in 40k, uh, and they have said explicitly this will refer to things such as champions and standard bearers. Uh, in previous games that could be pretty much that every champion has plus one attack. And these kind of rules have pros and cons. So uh, when you're learning the game, you don't have those rules written on the card in front of you. You will just have a word which says champion and that kind of thing. And we'll have to refer back to the rule book. But once you've played a few games and you've got used to those rules and they have said they are limited. Uh, so there's a reasonable chance you could learn those. Uh, they do actually make things quicker. So, you know. They touch upon Spearhead and mention that Spearhead is possible from the launch box. They also interestingly mention boards and terrain. Uh, and this isn't something we've necessarily had in the big launch boxes. Uh, and I do wonder if they are mixing the big launch box up with the tiered kind of starter sets that also tend to get released around launch. Uh, but it's very interesting to see if we do get boards and scenery as well in the big launch box. And that would be a, uh, a slight change in direction. Now Spearhead is something I've talked about on this channel before as well. Uh, they've announced the, the Vanguard boxes are pretty much shifting over to something called a Spearhead box. They contain a great starting force for a reduced price if you, in comparison to buying all these things separately. Uh, and what they're going to do is something that they've done in 40k which is basically adjust the stats and the rules for those models to make them balanced against every one of those other boxes. So if you were playing the full game uh, and bought a box and played against somebody else, your box might be worth 1,500 points of models and theirs might be worth 700 and there might not be any real synergy between those units and some of the stuff might not work and it, it would just be a mess and you couldn't really play an enjoyable game with those boxes or would be unlikely to. Uh, what they've done here is they've taken the idea of sort of new players, the idea of a game that might take around an hour or so uh, and they've adjusted the way that those units work. So they've decided that this unit here might punch a little bit less hard than they would do normally. Uh, and this one here has had these two rules taken off their war scroll because actually they interact with units that aren't even in the box. And on these ones they've actually added in a faction rule from their book uh, and things like that. So you can basically play it out of the box, you get cards and sheets and information and tokens if they're relevant. And it gives you a great opportunity to try multiple forces for instance and get a flavour for an army without having to commit fully. So onto the interesting stuff, what is next for Warhammer Age of Sigmar 4th Edition? So I think the theatrical trailer probably didn't show all of the models. Uh, Leviathan, the trailer did show pretty much everything. I think everything in that box, but that was unusual. So previous theatrical trailers haven't included everything. Uh, and it might have been when they were making that Leviathan trailer, they were just sort of like, oh, we can fit this one in here and this one in here. And then finally they were just like, oh, let's just chuck in those last two and then we got the whole set. However, on the off chance that when they're talking boards and scenery, they are chucking all that stuff in, that, that might be everything from the trailer. Um, however, uh, from the rumours online, it does suggest there's probably a Grey Seer rocking about for the Skaven. Seems very likely that if Ruination's been cracked open, it isn't just those three figures and then the, the Griffin person in that box. There's probably something else in there as well. So it does seem reasonable that we're going to see more than was actually uh, presented in the trailer. And of course, in the run-up to that box, we're likely to see all the reveals sort of drip-fed to us so we can get hyped and excited about it. Now, on the case of scenery, I've shared a few pictures on my channel uh, going back, I don't know, at least six months or so, where they've got the scenery that looks very much like the Dawnbringers um, scenery that's been available, where they're sort of building their settlements. But it looks like a full kit, uh, very much like the, the kind of Gondor buildings that have been released for Middle Earth strategy battle game. Now, the scenery team that work for uh, Warhammer Community and also White Dwarf and all over the shop, they do amazing things with limited kits. And it could just be them doing amazing things. But these really consistent buildings that look slightly different to the stuff that's available that do look like multi-part flexible kits to build city walls and city buildings. They look quite real to me. Now the big reason that these may just be the scenery team being super skillful is that we haven't seen these kits and they've been appearing in magazines and print and on the website for at least six months. I need to look back on when I said that first but that could just be that they plan to release them alongside something else that didn't perhaps happen. So I wouldn't discount it. And generally with a new edition, we do see new scenery. Right, so we've got the trailer, we've got the reveals of the box slowly, and then we get the box released in the summer. Predictions online are actually giving us a date for that box release. We have one suggestion that the box will be released on the 29th of June, uh, or pre-orders around the 22nd and creeping into July. Sounds reasonable. 
could be one of those rumors that's sort of a logical guess, but um, it's coming from reliable people in the rumor sphere. So we're getting these re reveals leading up to that point. Um, it's very likely afterwards that we will then get additional stuff outside of that box for the Skaven and for the Stormcast. This has pretty much always happened with a new edition, whether it's Nighthorn or whether it's the Cruel Boys, and they tend to be actually quite a lot of stuff. I'm still wondering if we will see new Plague Monks or where they are focusing and going hard on the Skyr and Mulder side of um, the Skaven. Now, no idea exactly what those are going to look like. Uh, and similarly for the Stormcast, it does seem likely that they're going to be redoing some of the stuff from First Edition and really kind of pruning down that battle tome for the Stormcast, which has become quite bloated. And of course, a ways down the line, there are some rumors that seem to be fairly solid that we're not getting Malarian Elves, which everybody's talked about for donkey's years and thought we're going to be the, uh, you know, it wasn't really Cruel Boys, it was going to be Malarian Elves, but actually that Chaos Dwarves are going to be returning in probably 2025, which is which is cool and exciting. And I'm interested to see the size of their hats, whether they go Forge World with little helmets or whether they go full. Uh, 80s, 90s big hats. So onto the blurry images which give us a hint of some of the other stuff that's in the box. Uh, there are eight of these and spoiler warning just look away I'll jump I'll, I'll do a chapter break when I go on to the next topic so if you want to skip this you can just skip chapter. All right spoilers. So, uh, so we've got eight images one of them is a new uh, scratchy Skaven marking which nobody really seems to know what it is which suggests this may be a united icon for the great clan of all the Skaven actually bundling together to <laughs> cause this mischief that they've managed. It's scary when Skaven work together. We then got a heavily armored and ornamented person which seems to uh, look very much like the leaked image for the core book cover, sort of glowering over a big, presumably a big hammer. Uh, and that's ruination because it's, it's all sort of super gothic, super sort of blanchy artworky. And then we've got what appears to be a prosecutor's wings with sort of almost eldritch flamey stuff coming out of the ends. Then a horn Skaven thing which looks like a rat ogre with a big horn coming out of it. But this could be a big creature for Mulder if it's not one of the ones we've already seen. In the final four images we've got another Ruinator which seems to be one of the ones from the trailer. A prosecutor with a new helmet with a bar down the front which seems to have divided the internet or a lot of people don't seem to like it. I, I don't mind it. Looks all right. Uh, what appears to be a rat ogre and finally what appears to be a sort of flamey trailing-y electric-y axe which looks really cool. Right on to Warcry. So Warcry is one of my favorite games. I love a fast-paced skirmish game. Uh, and we were chatting about Ossiarchs and uh, Sylvaneth, although I was saying Kanofi, just because Kanofi had turned up in uh, Underworlds and Warhammer Quest. So generally speaking, with sort of new ideas and these kind of things, Dark Oath did the same thing. They sort of start creeping through the games uh, before appearing in a wider range. It is standard Sylvaneth here, not Kanofi. Uh, however, the reason for guessing these two were a lot of people said Ossiark because they hadn't had anything in a while and the previous box was going to be Order versus Death. Uh, so a lot of people were sort of saying them. I was saying Nighthaunt and I was saying Nighthaunt for the same reason I've been saying Sylvaneth for a long time, which is that uh, on Warhammer TV they released a Loremaster videos about the Narwood and they included a picture of the Nighthaunt in the Narwood, uh, without really mentioning them, and they chatted a lot about the Sylvaneth being there. Uh, even though every single warband tome that the books released along Warcry had not mentioned the Sylvaneth once. Not a sausage, not a, not a snippet of them. Uh, so it was curious that they were suddenly in this lore video and I was kind of like, well, where have they got that from aside from the fact that we're in a, a wood or a forest? Anyway, here they are, arriving in a box called Briar and Bone. Uh, and the previous box, Hire and Flood, which seems to be a bit of a pun, uh, has not arrived yet. And we were told that one was actually due in winter. And generally these periods are actually the meteorological calendar as far as I can tell. I'm pretty sure that's what Games Workshop works to. So winter would have been December, January, February. That's running late. Uh, this could be due to the, sh you know, the worldwide shipping issues that are going on in the world at the moment. Uh, and it might be that these two boxes do actually arrive together in some time in spring. So for the Ossiarchs we had the Teratic Cohorts. Uh, one of the most interesting things from the interviews they mentioned was that they are playing around with the rules a little bit and doing new stuff in Warcry which is super interesting. So it was previously a different team but it's now actually the same team that work on Warhammer Underworlds where there's really creative playing around with the rules constantly and it's interesting to see that kind of creeping into Warcry. So what they've said about these Ossiarchs uh, is that they can play around with the uh, ability dice, uh, wild dice and that kind of thing and they can use them to boost their powers uh, which take away from their pool of dice for abilities uh, which is gonna be really interesting and that's brand new to Warcry. Uh, we've not had a warband mess about with those dice in a unique way at all. And the background for these chaps is that they are they are some of the hundreds or thousands or billions of people that have disappointed Nagash. Nagash is pretty easy to disappoint. He just wants a necrotopia across the realms, just death. 
Um, and anybody that doesn't want that, which is anybody that's alive pretty much, uh, pisses Nagash off. Now, these are Ossiarchs that have pissed him off, so they've kind of been constructed by him. And they said in the interview, actually, you know, even though they're built to do these things and do them well and that kind of thing, so whether it's a battle, some of those battles are being lost. So they could be a commander or a leader of a unit that for whatever reason has failed in their duty in Nagash's eyes. Nagash is, is not a nice leader. He's not gonna reflect on things and be like, well, maybe that was my bad or maybe they couldn't have won it. He's gonna be like, no, you're punished. You're now half horse. And that's what's happened here. Uh, so they've been flogged. So this Kavalos has turned into sort of a centaur creature. A number of them have a single eye, which is supposed to indicate Nagash looking through them. I'm not sure why Nagash couldn't look through two eyes, but that, that was what we were told. There might be a bit more in the lore when we find out more. And I'm pretty sure in the video, the, the little bone doggy things, they had some really cool alternate heads, sort of big horned ones. So I'm going to have to look back at that, but I'm pretty sure that was in there. And uh, if I'm editing the video, I might try and find a, an image of that, uh, which will say on the screen right now if you're watching the video version, whether I'm right or wrong about that. Sorry, podcast people. And we end on these creepy birdie things. So uh, throughout the reveals, there are loads of rumor engines solved as well, which I forgot to touch upon. I do love these, and Warboss Kurgan does an amazing website where they actually chart all the rumor engines, which ones have been solved, uh, which is a brilliant resource, and I would have missed a few of these without that. So we have two rumor engines solved by the Ossiarchs. Onto the Sylvaneth, who, before I forget, also solve a rumor engine themselves. They are the Twist World. They are infested with bizarre arcane parasites born from the Narwhal's misfiring Realm Shaper engines, and their minds are clouded by the saprophyte spores and bodies overgrown by constant agony. Uh, they're driven only by the obsessive hope to reach the Everspring Swathe and receive Alariel's healing touch. Now these are equally cool models, and if you're into the Silver Nerf, I think it'd be nice to see some of these sort of revisited, especially the Dryads. That's a pretty old kit, although I, I do like them, and I've shoved some bits of Dryads on my ogres. Sorry, Dryads. Now throughout you can see these horrible creeping vines kind of bursting forth, almost like a kind of um, chaos mutation but in plant form. Uh, and these kind of fungus growing up their face and that kind of thing, which is quite creepy. I do feel sorry for them. Now alongside these two, which is probably my favourite thing in the box, is just this humongous uh, four-legged gnarl oak that is actually just a big gnarl mouth. So it's called a ravening gnarl oak. And um, during the interview we are told a little bit more about this thing. So it's been completely tied down and fed, uh, basically. And because it's fed, it's quite happy to stay there and be tied down by the ropes. If you didn't keep on feeding it, it would go on the warpath. But as it's basically just fed there, fed sacrifices, whatever, it's got this bamboo platform, the mutating and changing energies of Gur just turn it into this big old mouth on legs, which is kind of almost adorable in a weird way. It looks like a kind of plasticine monster, and I kind of love it. So we know that the Moor Pit and a number of bits of sceneries from Scales of Talaxis have been available separate to the boxes, and I'm hoping they do the same thing with giant frog statue from F Pyre and Flood, uh, and also this ravening Gnarl Oak, because I think they're really cool. So we finish up on a Warband Tome, uh, also called Briar and Bone in these instances, and I've covered these in my previous review videos, but generally speaking, you'll get a load of lore about the two Warbands, what's going on in the Gnarlwood at the moment. Uh, previously with the Ogre Gorges, there were more pits popping up all over the place, even sucking in a whole settlement. And it's interesting to see what happens. I kind of get the feeling that Marwood is going to implode in on itself or get destroyed or Talaxis at the centre of it is going to just explode or something weird. I think it's... Uh, I'm not sure it's going to stick around or survive the next edition of Warcry at least. You'll also get a load of narrative content specifically for these warbands, uh, quests specifically for them with artefacts that are themed very much towards them. Uh, rules for the scenery, and generally some scenery cards and that kind of thing for actually using the new pieces. So what's next for Warcry? Now that's a bloody good question, and I don't know. So previously we had lots of different threads to pull on to sort of guess what was happening next. Uh, they gave us roadmaps, which would give us a full year of breakdown of releases and often sort of give us the Grand Alliance that was going to be appearing in that box, or even let us know that there was going to be a box in the first place. Now, for whatever reason, they haven't decided to renew roadmaps in any of these reveals, and that might be entirely down to the shipping issues. They might just not know when they're able to release these things, and they've decided, rather than upsetting people, uh, you know, and giving us a chance to make videos where we guess what's arriving, uh, they've decided to just bump those along and they might reappear at some point and I hope they do because it's nice to be able to make prediction videos without having to rely entirely on dodgy leaks and things. What do I think is coming? Well, I think they've kind of run the Narwood to the ground but if they were to finish using the Narwood I would have expected something in this article and this release to suggest something was happening that would actually tear us away from it. 
I'm expecting something climactic, something that kind of just goes right, that's that's over with, that's gone, that's exploded. So in terms of what I predicted before for changes, uh, I would love them to revisit Catacombs. I did pick up my version of Catacombs where they actually reduced it on the Games Workshop web store, which is something that hardly ever, ever happens, which does suggest to me that they might think it didn't sell especially well. Now, one of the reasons that box may not have sold well was that half the contents, including the core book, were identical to the box which was released only a year prior bringing Warcry into the world, uh, which was why I hadn't picked it up until that point, because it just wasn't worth that amount of money to get a duplicate of half the scenery, half the board, the book and that kind of thing, just to get the Catacombs version of the game. However, the Catacombs version of the great game was great! I loved it, it was a dungeon crawler version of Warcry. And it had some, it wasn't the fastest setup because you have some sort of options at the start, but but I really liked it. It was fun, it was a fun change. And given that the MacGuffin, the, the central driving force that's pulling everybody into the Narwood is a massive void ship full of treasures, uh, it seems like a logical place to revisit, a version of the game to revisit and sort of go into. Now, aside from roadmaps, the other place that I've pulled predictions from, and aside from the Lawmasters video, have been the Warband Tomes. Uh, for the first year and the first four books, they had a map that they'd slowly add icons to, and those icons corresponded to warbands that we knew nothing about that were appearing in the next release. So it was really good fun going, right, what is this? What's this that they've added to this map all of a sudden? Uh, however, in the last warband home with the uh, the Gordon Warpacks and the World of Core Hunters, uh, we just got a sort of zoomed in map on the area being discussed in that book, and there was nothing sort of new which suggested something new coming in, unless they were going kind to of focus in on this specific area, which seems really unlikely. So I didn't, there's nothing from that book that I took to think actually they've, they've seeded this with hints. And since then we've seen the new warbands and I don't remember anything from that book that pointed towards them. So that's it for Warcry. We might get a catacomb style thing, we might get something completely new. And I'll be really interested to see, given that we're jumping to a new realm focus, possibly actually, although it might be, you know, Giran and actually it'll be interesting to see that launch box and launch scenery maybe. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if Warcry jumps in that direction instantly or whether it waits another year until the next edition of Warcry arrives in 2025. Right, on to Warhammer the Old World and this is turning into a long video so sorry, thank you for getting this far, thank you. Uh, so dwarfs, dwarves were predicted in my previous video, they were very likely to be coming, there's somebody going to be coming alongside the greenskins, they make sense. Uh, still no rumblings of the Battle for Skull Pass returning which I think would be a logical step for Games Workshop. It contains models which could be used in both these forces. Really good value, They've, they can just bash them out and they've done it with previous boxes. So I'm hoping that happens. The goblins have formed the basis of my Age of Sigma army and they're just really handy and quick to paint. So this time around I'm, I was wondering if the, the missing dwarf uh, sprue, which is plopped around the internet and was rumoured to be broken, uh, was going to make a reappearance given they've been digging into the archives and that sadly doesn't seem to be the case which does lend credence to the idea that this sprue or the master mold for this sprue was in fact broken and I assume the sprue lost because I would imagine if they had the sprue still they could retroactively build it. I don't know how these things work but I imagine they could do something. They could probably scan it nowadays and make something. Uh, anyway, we're getting uh, a new plastic dwarf though, a shield bearer. Uh, and this creates a Dwarf King or a Thane on shield or a King or a Thane on foot. Alongside this, you are getting none other than Ungrim Iron Fist, who was still the king at this time. Much more ginger beard and an angry Slayer King. Uh, he's really cool. He exists right into the, uh, the end times, which we shall not speak about. And that's not all, you're also getting a Dwarf Thane with handgun stood on an oaf stone. So actually more than I was expecting for the dwarfs. Loads of old models coming back, the goblin here is coming back, which I wasn't expecting because I sort of thought that was linked to a mercenary group or, or kind of a new one from the sort of Dogs of War days, although I haven't, haven't checked this. Let me know in the comments. <laughs> I thought that was almost like a one-off made during that period or sort of unique to those dwarfs. It'd be like getting the Slayer Pirates pop up. Although they're quite long-lived, so they might have still existed back then. What's really cool about this release and makes me excited for seeing what they release as they continue on is just the, the range of really old minis that they've dug out the archaic archives and are doing made to order runs for and it's just really cool to see. I love the old models. I'm somebody that has been sort of set up loads of alerts on eBay over time to pick up some of my older goblin models and that kind of thing. Once, once models that I loved but I missed when they were out during their run. Uh, and it's just so cool that people have the opportunity to pick these up without paying potentially scalper prices. So this leaves us with five core factions remaining to get a release. That's the Empire of Man, the Wood Elf Realms, the High Elf Realms, the Beastmen Brayherds, and the Warriors of Chaos. Now originally I was thinking all of these would be released in doubles, very much in the same style as the Bretonians and the Tomb Kings. 
However, the Orcs and Goblins are already popping up on pre-order, so it does suggest that these will just sort of be drip-fed over the course of the year, with my predictions that we might get Empire vs Empire in some kind of release, because, you know, Civil War, there's multiple empires, uh, multiple emperors rather at this point, uh, is kind of moot. And in terms of what I'm expecting for War of the Old World next, well, it's, it's going to be one of those factions I was originally thinking they'd be paired up, so Wood Elves and Beastmen would make sense. Uh, and in my mind, if the Empire was versus the Empire because of the Civil War, uh, it would have been High Elves versus the Warriors of Chaos, which I don't quite know where the narrative would, uh, would justify that, but nobody likes Chaos. None of the good factions. I'm not going to touch on the good and evil debate. Yeah, not too sure. Sorry, nothing more to add here at the moment. Right, on to Kill Team. Beta Decima, Beta Decima is the focus again, so that's the uh, that's the, the water world with the big sort of, you know, oil riggy type scenery. Uh, that's the focus still for Kill Team. Gene Stillers have taken over this world and we're going to see part of that faction here in a really cool version of them uh, where they're kind of veteran guardsmen. So during the interview they did say that sometimes Gene Stealers will perhaps take over a regiment and that regiment will perform really well. They might be like the Commissar's favourite regiment because they're so good. Uh, but actually it's because they're, they're gene stealers, they've got a little extra edge on your regular human that's been plucked from a world and popped out on the front line to last like 11 minutes, I think, as they say is the average for guardsmen. I do also suggest actually it could be a, a, an amazing regiment that the gene stealers target and manage to insidiously kind of work their way into. Now what's really cool with them is they are coming with a load of extra models that we have seen before, with the Magos and the Broodlord making this a much chunkier box than you're usually getting for Kill Team. Alongside these are brand new Votan, uh, they're Jaegers, so we've previously seen this type of Votan um, riding the kind of hover trikes. Uh, they've got the trencher coats. Um, they are kind of the, the ones they drop in to do all sorts of foul play and guerrilla warfare and assassinating targets, and they're very much designed to be able to work behind the front lines and work independently. However, in this particular battle, uh, that hasn't gone to plan at all. They've been shot down on this Gene Stealer heavy planet and they're having to do what they do quite well actually and fend for themselves but uh, it makes it quite entertaining that the box is actually geared very much towards the gene stealers as well they've got loads more choice and you could really make it hard for them by doing an outnumbered force of gene stealers versus them in the game of kill team the votan i describe very much as playing as board control focused and the bombast has a cool ability to get some extra shots in before anybody else does and the brood brothers are very much what you could expect from a veteran guardsman level plus some really beefy hq choices so the brood lord is basically one of the nastiest things to arrive in this edition of Kill Team. Uh, so he does, of course, uh, take up a number of places for your operatives if you did choose to use him. Uh, in terms of what's next for Kill Team, I mentioned earlier for 40k I heard rumblings of Vespids, but I've not really kept track of 40k Kill Team rumours, so on the off chance uh, Valrak rocks up, I will pin the comment. I don't know what's happening next for Kill Team, let me know in the comments. Sorry. So Warhammer Underworlds, um, I do love this game. I haven't played it in a good few years, but these models are so cool. I'm really, really tempted by this box. And the only reason I haven't played it is just, just time, really. I really got into Warcry and I've only got so much hobby time and gaming time, and that's pretty much gone over the last couple of months uh, and we will for the next year or so, just due to family and stuff. Uh, which is a priority. Uh, so uh, we have Winter War. This looks awesome. I We had a silhouette in the preview, which I thought was originally, um, there were all these rumor engines with these cantankerous bits of metal and wood and stuff, which I really thought was a destruction construct. I thought it was a green skin. Um, potentially uh, the Frazzle Gits, because uh, they worship the sun in Hish. So that's the, the Goblin Wolf Riders, the Git Mob. I thought it might be them. Uh, however, the silhouette appeared and it was much more narrow and taller. Uh, turns out to be two guys in a trench coat, which I would have never predicted, but it's brilliant. And, and some people online were suggesting these could be flagellants. Whilst I'm on the topic, uh, more rumor engines solved. So that's two rumor engines for them. And also four rumor engines uh, back for the Kill Team box, which uh, I'm, I may have edited in now. So in this box, the crazy flagellant type people are the brethren of the Bolt. They've all been struck by lightning at some point, or blasted when a Stormcast has appeared or exploded, uh, and got a bit nuts, so they've, they've embraced the divine uh, electricity of Sigmar and sort of gone down this hyper-religious route. 
and they chatted in the video interview about the mechanics of them in the game. Uh, so they all start inspired, uh, and when they're inspired they, they had the power of the electricity coursing through their proby proddy taser weapons. And once they zap somebody with a powerful attack, they are no longer inspired. So they can also uh, re-inspire them by doing an attack through somebody else. So they sort of almost like charge their electricity through somebody and they get all buzzed up and become inspired again. And it sounds like a really fun mechanic and goes really nicely with the models. Uh, the models themselves are just crying to turn up in something like Mordheim or if anybody has that sort of Mordheim, you know, really dark fantasy vibe. They're, they're, they're brilliant. Uh, they're, they're really, uh, really cool models. They are against the Skinnerkin. Uh, we're seeing more ghouls. The Flesh Eater Quartz range has been absolutely phenomenal. The background for them is so bonkers and bizarre and unique to Age of Sigmar. It makes me love the setting more just having them there. And these are really nice models just on par with what's come before. Uh, they are the, the chefs, the chefs of an exquisite level for the flesh eaters and they, they take their craft seriously. So when they're cutting chunks off the enemy, they are not eating it straight away. They are, they are taking the prize cuts and actually retaining them for a feast, uh, which is impressive for a hungry cannibalistic ghoul. As ever, they come with a couple of Universal Rivals decks, so this is one of the deck building modes. So um, if you pick up Warhammer Underworlds at the moment, um, your Warband comes with a deck, and that's one way of playing, so you can just play out of the box, play with that deck. Uh, another Rivals format, or is it Nemesis? I think it's Nemesis format, where you can shuffle in a single other deck, and, and you get two of those in this box. So there's actually a lot of playability. If you just picked up this box, you're playing it with a partner or a friend, uh, you get a load of playability with Warhammer Underworlds, and I would really recommend trying it. It's, it's great to get in sort of three games in quick succession, hyper competitive, but also really chilled and fun. So in terms of what's happening next, uh, this is in a similar space to Warcry. Uh, so before we did have a roadmap, we could predict broadly what was coming because we were told it's something for destruction, it's something for order. I mean, destruction's always an exciting one because there's not many destruction factions and one of those are giants which just don't fit in Underworlds, aside from that one White Dwarf article where they sort of shoved in a uh, glass, mass, glass Mad Gargan, I think it was called. Um, which, which was cool. And I keep on hoping that Spider Fang Grotz will make an appearance there sometime, but I've been saying this for a couple of years, so it is just wish listing. This is not this is not a prediction anymore. It's just they're one of the sub factions that hasn't appeared, and if they're still interested in doing them, then they might. But yeah, no real idea. Um, previously I predicted Demons of Nurgle. I was I was erring between Demons of Nurgle um, and uh, Plague Monks for Skaven, and it was just because they were some sub factions that hadn't appeared. We've also got Molder. I wouldn't be shocked if Mulder Skaven appear, given they've done so much for the launch of Age of Sigmar 4th edition and they feature heavily, or Skya. Uh, but Demons of Nurgle are one of the sort of demons that haven't popped up in this and they seem to be working their way through each of them. So I think they'll pop up. I think we'll probably see more Skaven. I think they've gone on a Skaven sculpting binge. There'll probably be some more rock up. And aside from that, no idea, because I could not have predicted two flagellants with electric probes in a trench coat. And we end on the teasers, which sort of disappointed people, but didn't really disappoint me because we were told they'd be teasers. I guess we didn't really know what we were expecting from a teaser. Uh, if, you be, if you've kept your ear to the ground around rumours, uh, then add mech plastics for Horus Heresy were something that was rumoured, and the teaser is just an ad mech symbol appearing for Horus Heresy, so people were disappointed. But for people that haven't kept their ear to the ground and the rumours, then that could be really exciting, because they'd be like, yes, it's ad mech, I didn't know that was a thing, I recognise that symbol, so... I have mixed feelings on the teasers. Um, I think for a lot of people, there's probably the majority of people out there, given the hundreds of thousands of people that are tuning into this thing. There's probably loads that don't spend ages on forums or listening to Burks like me chat away on the internet. They're probably like, actually, yeah, that's really cool. We'll, we'll listen to the pros when they do their proper videos and be delightfully teased. The Necromunda or Necromunda Secundus, as we're expecting it to be, had a, a silhouette of a load of models. And I think that's why people were slightly miffed on the um, Mechanicus hint for Horus Heresy, just that there were no miniatures kind of teased. Uh, and if you're wondering what Necromunda Secundus is all about, or Hive Secundus, then Necromunda's been subject to a large number of planetary invasions, rebel uprisings and alien incursions. One of the blighted scars as an example of this is Hive Secundus, once known as the second city of Necromunda. It was a beautiful place, but then an alien cult rose to power in the Underhive and over 20 years war raged. They basically then nuked it <laughs> from orbit, uh, and the aliens that were there somehow, some of them being like little cockroaches, managed to survive that. It's not a nice place. Which does almost suggest that alongside Kill Team, we're also potentially getting some gene stealery, alien-y activity in Necromunda, which would be really cool. Right, so that's it for me anyway. If you have enjoyed this video, and it's a really long video, so if you got this far, oh, well done. 
Um, please do feel free to like and subscribe, but only if you did like it and want to subscribe for more stuff like this. Uh, I do have a couple of videos in the wings, uh, dependent on family time. Uh, one of those is a lore video for a Warcry Warband, and another one of those is something I started editing like a year ago, if I can make that work. And I've got a few ideas for more of the Jackal Cast kind of series, and I might even do one around becoming a YouTuber just using your mobile, which I've done for the last year and a half, because it's quite easy and I'd love to see what you can all do this, and I'd love to see what other people can do and sort of encourage you to just pick up your phone and give it a go. So um, anyway, if there's any of those that you'd really like to see, um, please do shout. If you've got any comments about what I've covered, anything I've missed that's really obvious, any criticisms, fire them away. I'm open to critical feedback and I will always try and improve these videos. Right, thanks so much for your time. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye-bye.